I like faith that feels expansive, that encompasses more, that goes for breadth and depth and lots of gray. Non-dual consciousness, it is called in spiritual language. This is the kind of thinking that seeks a third way, that doesn't buy into dualistic thinking or binary choices or win-lose scenarios. This is the thinking that lives and breathes both and perspectives. So when we hit language like we hit today, it feels jarring. And frankly, I don't much like it. In the collect, we get a vision of God's son who came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Devil versus children of God. This versus that. Joshua is setting up this choice. Follow the gods of your ancestors that were beyond the river, like that land that Abraham left around the Euphrates, or those gods your ancestors served down in Egypt, or the gods of the Amorites in the land you're currently living in, or serve the Lord. You cannot serve both the Lord and those foreign gods, Joshua says, because he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. The Lord versus foreign gods. Make your choice. Either this or that. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is tackling what will happen to those who have already died. Paul makes a distinction. There will be those who are informed who won't have to grieve like others do who have no hope. Those who believe that Jesus died and rose again, which gives Paul's audience grounds for hope because through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died versus the uninformed who don't hold such a belief, who are grieving because they have no grounds for hope for those who have died. The informed versus the uninformed. You're either this or that. And in the first section of Matthew 25, those wise bridesmaids and those foolish ones. Does this story get any more dualistic? Jesus uses this story to describe what the kingdom of heaven will be like. Let's hear this again slowly. Jesus said, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took those flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. Uh Uh-oh. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. And Jesus finishes with, Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Such a hard passage. I love what Cynthia Bergeau does with this passage in her book, The Wisdom Jesus. First, 
she notes that a lot of Christianity sets up Jesus as nice, like a good southerner. Jesus is nice, and he wants us to be nice too. Bergeau asks, if Jesus is about sharing, wouldn't it be nice for the five ladies who had their oil to share it with their friends? Nice Jesus. This is a Jesus who isn't going to make many waves, who is going to be pretty supportive of our status quo, who's going to make all kinds of concessions to keep the peace, go along to get along. This Jesus isn't going to provoke us much, isn't going to unsettle us much, isn't going to be much of a prophet, really. This is a Jesus who pretty much fits into our culture on our terms. Jesus pretty much dismantles nice Jesus in this Matthew 25 passage. Bergeau makes the case that Jesus is teaching at a whole different level here. She writes, and hang in there with me on this, these hard teachings are exclusively about inner transformation, not outer actions, and make sense only within that frame of reference. The reason the five bridesmaids who have oil can't give it to the five who don't is that the oil symbolizes something that has to be individually created in you through your own conscious striving. Nobody can give it to you. Nobody can take it away from you. The oil stands for the quality of your transformed consciousness. And unfortunately, she writes, it is impossible to become conscious unconsciously through a donation from somebody else. You have to do the work yourself. If you consider the five wise bridesmaids, and hear the word wise, she says, as those who have acquired the oil of non-dual consciousness, they can't possibly share it with their sisters, even if they want to. Their sisters would not yet be ready to receive it. This is a hard teaching. It's not that Jesus is trying to separate out those who get to come into the wedding banquet from those who don't. Jesus is simply describing what is true. Union with him, relationship with him, is not a spectator sport. We don't get to borrow somebody else's oil to get there. Bergeau is right. It's got to be firsthand experience. And I would add, it's this dance. The striving we do doesn't produce the oil. The oil of awareness, the oil of consciousness, of awakeness, it always comes as a gift. But we do have a role in cultivating the space in our heart that can receive the gift, that can recognize the gift, that can accept the gift. That is our work, and it's hard work. It's vulnerable work. It's work that calls us to make choices all the time. Take the way of the devil, Diabolos, who lives to throw us apart, or the hard road of holding together all that this world says must be divided. Take the easy road with the foreign gods that make you feel secure in the moment, but have no depth, or the unsettling wilderness with the Lord who won't be nailed down or contained. Take the road of certitude with what you can see and know, or throw your lot in with the irrepressible hope that comes when you walk with Jesus on the path of dying and rising. 
put in the time, the energy, the vulnerability, the surrender necessary to join Jesus in the oil of union that can light your life and the deepest part of your night, or keep trying to borrow that oil from someone else that looks so attractive, oil that you yearn for, but oil that is not of the wondrous, mysterious alchemy that Jesus is longing to co-create with you in your heart and soul and being. Jesus isn't trying to keep anybody out of the wedding banquet, quite the opposite. Jesus longs for each one of us not to settle for cheap and easy substitutes for him. Jesus longs for us to cultivate the wisdom that knows the difference between what the world is offering and what he is offering. Jesus longs for us not to settle for anything short of the oil of union with him, cultivated with love and intention in our own hearts. The oil of awakeness to the life that he longs to share with us. This is so much richer, so much deeper, so much more than hanging out with nice Jesus. Hard though it is, don't settle for anything less.